So you've decided to become a soldier after all? That's all the proof I need. You're not ready to learn flame alchemy. But sir, I am. Oh, is this a flashback? The military needs alchemists. It's a matter of defending our homes. We don't help I'm them. I'm tired of hearing that vile rhetoric. <coughs> I can't stand to see you like this. There's no reason for a man of your stature to suffer in this kind of squalor. If you would simply join the military, you could get grants for your research. You could I don't need a grant for something I've already completed. You've finished your research? I've created the most powerful alchemy. It would only cause tragedy if I placed it in the wrong hands. And now that I've finished it, I've allowed myself to grow complacent. First of all, I love that we're going into Roy's backstory. So bright and full of hope and pragmatism. I can't help but compare this guy to Zhang Zhang because he's a fire alchemist, right? He understands the destructive power of his work and he's alienated himself, it seems, from society at large that wants to use his powers. And like Zhang Zhang, it seems like he's right and wrong, you know? Like he's right about the destructive power that it's about to cause because we know what Roy did in the war. But it's also an incomplete story because it's not about the power itself, but it's how you use it. And we know that Roy will go on to do great things. At least I hope so. But this kind of character is always someone that I'm going to respect just because the idea of looking past rhetoric, as he called it, and being so principled that you're willing to sacrifice for your beliefs, that to me is awesome and inspiring. Like I'll always value independence of thought, even if I don't agree with where that thought leads. Because at least you can say the person is autonomous. At least the person is self-directed. And I think that's, that's a rare and admirable quality. And there's such an interesting challenge framed here, right? Because Roy, you know, he's young and idealistic, but his challenge is, well, shouldn't we do something with this power? Shouldn't we do something to help people? And we know from the show that the homunculi are terrible and the war is terrible, but there also is something to that. And I think this guy points it out really nicely by talking about the fact that he has slipped into complacency. And to me, that's a really interesting question because it's like, to what extent do your principles compel you to action? How much responsibility do you have for the events in the world? When is stepping back from something, the right action? And when is it just you hiding from your own responsibility? And conversely, when is you taking action your responsibility? And when is it you being driven by idealism or greed or your own selfish interests? You know, it's really like a tricky thing to try to balance out and figure out. Trust me, I've been dead for a long time. <laughs> Master! <laughs> Are you all right? Master Hawkeye! No, it's not all right. Look after. Master Hawkeye. She's in possession of my research. That adds a new layer to their relationship. And he died in Roy's arms? Episode 30, the Ishval... I can't even read it. Episode 30, the Ishvalan War of Extermination. Oh, good. Oh, great. This is what I wanted. Oh, boy. Here we go. You should take this. You can call me in the military if you need to. Be cautious accepting that, Hawkeye. I know it's the only way to make a difference, and I know I'll never be happy if I don't try to make this country a better place. <laughs> Man, that must have sounded pretty childish, huh? Not at all. There's nothing childish about caring. Can I trust you, Roy, with my father's research? I guess there's a lot we don't know about Hawkeye, too. No, Hayate. Bad dog. Sorry about that. Don't worry. It happens all the time. It does. I couldn't pull the trigger. Well, I was just useless. Tell me what happened. Ed continues to be really hard on himself. It wasn't his fault at all. She could have shot him. But deep down, I knew that would be wrong. And all of a sudden, that gun seemed like something evil. Good instincts. I honestly think she would have shot him if I hadn't been there. She could hardly stop crying once I got the gun away. And it's my fault. I've got no resolve. I only managed to make things worse. You're just dwelling on this stuff because you made it back alive. <sighs> you need to stay focused on living. That's how you'll help Winry. True. How else can you protect her? Mm. I mean, after all, you love her, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> he does. That's, that's <laughs> proof right there. It's not like that. Love We're confirmed. She's like family to me. I mean, of course, I'm going to protect her, you yeah, know? Yeah, keep protesting. That is a bizarre interpretation of what happened. In my eyes, Ed saved her. 
He saved her soul. There was no going back for Winry if she pulled the trigger. Whether or not Winry actually would have shot is sort of besides the point. I mean, the, the main point for me and the two of them is that Ed showed that he cares about her and was there for her to support her when she needed it most. And that's a huge gift. And probably related to why she, very shortly after, decided that she had feelings for him. I think if you can point to any wrongdoing there, and I don't think it's really wrongdoing, I just think it was maybe a mistake, was just not telling Winry about it earlier. That sort of set her up a little bit. But I've killed too many to feel sorry for myself. Besides, I can't deny that I'm the one who chose this path. It's very responsible. You Ishval? Can I ask you about that? Please don't. Would it be all right? I'm with Hayate. Ishval Here we go. Is a harsh and barren country. Now stand down! I am the only man able to take the lead in this battle! Roy. Those savages for the dogs! Damn them! Damn them! It's Hughes. Hey, Roy! Roy Mustang! Come on, Roy, give me something to redeem you right now. You've changed since the last time I saw you. I could say the same, Hughes. You have the eyes of a killer. Yeah, it's not exactly the future we imagined when we were at the Academy. <laughs> What? What's wrong? I've still got a beautiful future, and her name is Gracia. She's patiently waiting at Central for the day I can come home. I got a little advice for you. It happens in movies and novels all of the time. The soldiers who never shut up about their girls back home, they don't make it. That's a good point. That's true. Hello, Major Mustang. Long time no see. Do you still remember me? Damn this war. Even her. She has the eyes of a killer, too. Full Metal Alchemist. Riza Hawkeye. Damn, this is depressing. Riza Hawkeye again. Just a little more cleavage. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to watch characters that we love do terrible things. I mean, especially Hughes. I can't think of many examples right now, or maybe even any examples, where shows would put their characters, you know, sympathetic characters, in these terrible situations doing these horrible things. It kind of forces the viewer, I think, to deal with the complexity of it. One thing is, I think we can sympathize with the idea of doing what you think is right and believing that the ends justify the means. Roy definitely believes that, right? Like, he wants to shape the future through being a leader and the military, and this is his role in the military. The other thing that I think is more complicated and maybe harder to understand is talking about characters as if they are one solid entity. For example, I get comments like, let's not forget what Roy did in the war. And I think that's valid. You know, that's a valid thing. It is something terrible that he did, and that's something to keep in mind, right? But I think that something that's often missed, or maybe not weighted heavily enough, is time. I think we think of characters as solid objects that are, they are just this, right? And so Roy having done these terrible things means Roy is terrible. But I think a more zoomed out view is that characters, like real people, do terrible things but live long lives. Like, will Roy always have done this? Yes, that's always going to be something that's with him and with his character. Is he always someone detestable because of what he's done? That's a harder question to ask. And I think there are important implications to that question too, because it also affects how we see each other, how we treat each other. I think a lot of times our image of other people is very tightly bound on that on that narrow spectrum of like good or bad, good person, bad person, when the reality is so much more complicated because a person is a complex thing, right? They are who they were before at, at any given time and they're also who they are now. And while there's a common belief that people don't change, I personally am very convinced that people can change. It just has to be a very concerted effort. And I know for a fact that great people can do terrible things and also weirdly terrible people can do great things so it's really confusing but i think a really solid view is to try to be as nuanced and complex as possible in our dealings with other people and in our view of other people and allowing for change and allowing for forgiveness as long as you're not doing it blindly as long as you're not giving trust where it's not due or like setting yourself up to be harmed or something like that i think that's a more positive view but i also think it's a more useful view long term you know because we want to allow people to improve we want to allow people to become better people otherwise there's sort of no hope for us right like if we're all judged by the worst of our actions, then we're all just terrible. Why are we being ordered to kill citizens when we should be the ones protecting them? It's good to see some conflict about it, at least. to be used to help people. Right. So why is it being used to kill them instead? Because that's yeah, the job all we state alchemists have been given to do. Except for this guy. You ask why we're here Kimberly, killing these course. people instead of protecting them? Because this is a war and that's what soldiers do. Isn't that right? That's enough, Kimberly. I'll tell you what I don't get. Did you people expect something different? You act like you're surprised, like you didn't choose this. <laughs> Did you put on that uniform thinking you wouldn't be asked to kill? The one thing worse than death is to avert your eyes from it. Look straight at the people you kill. Don't take your eyes off them for a second. 
And don't ever forget them, because I promise that they won't forget you. Hughes, can you tell me why you fight? It's simple. I don't want to die. That's the only reason. The reasons are always simple. Wow. That's another complicated thing, right? Like, Kimberly is obviously enjoying this and loves to inflict pain, but he's also not wrong calling Roy out for not being aware of what he's doing. I mean, they're all aware. Or if they weren't aware, it's sort of a willful ignorance. Like he said, like, what do you expect from being a soldier in a war against the Ishvalans? And also about what Hugh said about the reasons always being simple and tying that into the idea of rhetoric. That is sometimes where idea pathways flow. The way to evoke movement or to invoke action in large numbers is through emotion. And a lot of times, one of the purest forms of that is feeling like it's a matter of survival, like feeling your way of life is attack or that very directly your life is under attack. And that's sort of the path to power and also the path to evil, right? Is boiling things down to make them justifiable. I can feel it deep in my bones, like a part of me I never noticed before. That sound is an extension of my being. And this land, this land that's governed by death, I will paint it red with this shard of destruction. And Kimberly's still around. I mean, we're probably going to see him again. You're asking me to take your life in place of the remaining tens of thousands of Ishvalans. That's correct. I stand How arrogant of you. Do you sincerely believe that your single life is equivalent to the remaining multitude of your followers? Damn, I'm going to throw it back at him. Your life is not enough to call off the extermination. How can you be so inhuman? You will suffer the hell of God! Knew. God, you say? Now this is intriguing. How much longer do you think your God plans to wait before unleashing his fury? Oof. Just how many thousands of lives must I take before he decides to strike me down? You're a monster! Open your eyes. God is nothing more than a construct created by man to inspire fear and promote order. If you wish to see me struck down for all these atrocities, use your own hands to do so, not God's. Yikes. I'll do whatever it takes to protect the people I love. And in turn, they'll protect the ones they love. We've heard this before. It seems like the least we tiny humans can do for each other. Right. Yeah, this classic moment. Crazy how Bradley chose that moment to ridicule their god, but that sort of isn't how god works, right? Like, if you're talking about the all is one, one is all god, things just play out. But if there's a flow and a process to life, you imagine that eventually what is or what the will of universal principles are will come to be no matter what. And everything else is just a step along the way. You can't really judge by the, the individual moments, you have to judge by the whole, and it's a whole that we can't see. I think the timeline of events adds something, because we can see how the war itself was a big part of Roy's motivation to become leader and to change things, and to protect the people he cared about. If the world truly operates based on the principles of equivalent exchange, then we soldiers have plenty to give back. If this world is meant to prosper, then it is our duty to carry the bodies of the dead across a river of blood to their resting place. She was motivated too, by the war. If I ever deviate from this path, then I want you to shoot me, and I'm trusting you to do so. Do you accept my offer? Of course I do, sir. I'll follow you into hell if you ask me to. She wasn't lying. Those who were praised as heroes during the Ishvalan campaign will be brought to trial as war criminals. <laughs> That's right. In a just, peaceful world, after all that we've done, we'll be seen as mass murderers. The homunculi were the ones pulling the strings. They caused the civil war. Even if they were the ones responsible for it, we were the soldiers who carried it out. <laughs> you should never avert your eyes from death. Never forget the people you've killed. Wow. Trust me. No matter how much time passes, they will never forget the ones who killed them. She learned something from Kimberly. Excuse me, Mr. Arner? Huh? I just wanted to thank you for your help. You saved both of our lives. My name's not Mr. Armor. <laughs> it's Alphonse Elric. Your name is Elric? You remember Edward Elric, don't you? The little alchemist you screamed at? Well, I'm actually his younger brother. It's kind of a long story. But I lost my body. So you're his younger brother, huh? You uh -oh. probably look just like him then. How uh -oh. rude! For starters, I am way taller than my brother is. And I don't have a mean face like his. And I'm a much better fighter, too. And I don't have a temper like he does. I'm a gentleman. <laughs> Damn, this is sort of mean. I knew, that, I knew that's where this was going. I knew it. I really hope that you get your body back soon. Oh. Well, thank you. This girl needs to chill a little bit. <laughs> what a weird ending. <laughs> After that heavy episode about war and... Yeah, we get 
a little romance to end things off. So about Hawkeye's speech at the end, I respect the fact that she takes responsibility. Even though she wasn't the origin, she was the, the vehicle for something. And that was a choice that she made. And even if they were somewhat blind to that choice, even if they weren't fully considering it, it was close enough for them to have gotten it. And I think there's sort of a willful ignorance that comes with participating in things just because you don't know the other option, or because it seems right as deemed by your superiors, or because that's the flow of society, right? There's sort of an excuse and an escape in that. But it's something that I also can sympathize with because, you know, like I've said a bunch recently, the alternative is not easy. The alternative is rough. I don't think most people have the stomach for that. I also think, like I said earlier, that, you know, it's a difficult question of how do you shape things? How do you shape the world in ways that you think are appropriate without participating in the world and participating in the way the world is going? I think that challenge is well framed by Roy, right? Because Roy could be principled, right? He could have been principled and not joined the military, but then he wouldn't be Roy, right? He wouldn't have the power he has now. And so it's just so sticky. It's really, really hard to wrap your mind around. How do you participate in power? How do you gain power without becoming the evil that you're fighting, you know, or without resorting to evil as a means to an end? A lot of really challenging questions that come out of this, and I think that's part of a great design for the story in the show. It's deliberate putting these characters in these situations. There's just so much moral gray area in ways that most shows just don't, don't dare touch. So a lot of respect to the writing for that. But yeah, the nickname Twisting the Knife definitely applies here to this episode. I'm sort of glad that it came up. I've been kind of waiting for it. Like, I knew we were going to get a little bit more on the backstory of the Ishvalan War. I think we sort of needed that closure. We needed to see how it went down with the characters. And I think character-wise, it was of great benefit to Roy and Hawkeye, not only as individuals and their conflict and their resolve to do better, but also their relationship with each other. So that's really cool. Also, even though it's a very small thing, it adds something to me to know that Roy started out having that teacher who was really against the war and really against Roy using his power, because that allows for his vision to be realized, the teacher's vision, over time as Roy refines his values in hopefully a way that is neither the flaws of Roy as a young man or the flaws of the teacher, which was just total uninvolvement. There probably is something better than that, right? Like we saw with Zhang Zhang, where Zhang Zhang was like, I'm done with fire. We see at the end of Avatar that he uses his powers for good and he actually helps shape the world in a meaningful way. And so Roy started out doing a lot of evil, but he might end up doing a lot of good with his power. And I think that's a more appealing message overall, right? It's not like your powers are good or bad. It's not that your traits are good or, or bad. It's about how you use them and what they're connected to. Like what principles and values are they connected to? And what is your actual goal? Is your intent to get ahead? Is your intent to win at any cost? Or is your intent to use the things you have to try to do good things in a pure way that is not destructive. So overall, another really tough episode. I feel like I'm becoming a little bit more resilient. Maybe it's because nothing can be as bad as Nina Xander. But yeah, see you for the next episode.